Good morning, good evening. Thank you very much for joining us in this virtual event on FinTech and the future of finance. Let me extend a warm welcome to Mary Makta, our panelist and global audience. My name is Jean Pem. I'm the Global Director for Finance in the Equitable Growth Finance and Institution Vice Presidency of the World Bank. FinTech, or the application of digital technology for financial services, is reshaping the future of finance. In response, as early as 2018, together with the International Monetary Fund, we launched the Badi FinTech Agenda, a set of policy considerations to foster the opportunities while mitigating the risk of FinTech. A lot has changed since. The ongoing digitalization of financial services and money around the world continues to transform the financial sector landscape from payment and lending services offered by e-commerce big tech to central bank digital currency. It is creating opportunities to build more inclusive and efficient financial services and promote economic development, but it also brings new challenges and risk. Given the continued rapid development in digital financial services, we publish our new flagship report, FinTech and the Future of Finance, Market and Policy Implications. The report is a collaborative effort between the World Bank and the International Finance Corporation, the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. And this report builds on the World Bank Group experience and expertise working with our client countries to support responsible financial innovation and FinTech. It's really my pleasure to welcome Marie Pangestu, the World Bank's Managing Director, Development Policy and Partnership, we will share today's panel discussion. And Mark Tadio, Managing Director of IFC, who will offer his reflection on fintech and the digitalization of financial services from a private sector perspective. We are also joined by distinguished representatives of the private and public sectors. We will discuss the opportunities and challenges related to the future of fintech. The panelists will engage in an exchange of views on tele technological innovation and its impact on the financial sector. And that could look like in the future. And they will discuss what industry and policymakers can do to reap the benefit of fintech while limiting the risk. I very much look forward to a very interesting discussion. And without further ado, let me give the floor to Magda Diop, Managing Director of IFC, to share his perspective. Thank you very much, Magda. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much, Jean. It's a pleasure to be to join you. Uh, and thank you very much to the team, to, uh, to Mary, my colleague and the dear friend who, who has been doing a fantastic job uh, leading this, uh, this work at uh, the World Bank. Uh, and I would like to really welcome uh, our distinguished panel and the audience today which is joining us uh, 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 around the world. For me, uh, this topic at a personal level is very close to my heart. Having been uh, supervising for three years the digital work at the World Bank, but also having been working in countries where I've seen a very quick evolution of the uh, financial landscape. So uh, for IFC's this report, uh, uh, this event and this topic are incredibly important for us because for our, for our objective of creative inclusive economy, we have been investors in fintech for 15 years, uh, providing over half a billion dollars in equity capital for more than 60 innovative fintechs. We have also worked diligently with financial institutions to enable the digital transformations and adoption of fintech solutions. It's from this perspective as an investor in inclusive financial innovations that I would like to share some thoughts just to kick off the conversation. Today, we are in a totally different way. Every single person around the world can own and have access to a mobile phone. For the first time in the history of mankind, almost all humans are linked through one universal or interoperable network, enabling personal connection, financial inclusion, and productivity activity. A computer programmer in Egypt can now study programming at MIT and work for an Indian uh, tech firm without even having to leave uh, a, a home. And that was very important when you know that we are facing some shocks sometimes. We do not allow us to travel as the ones that we faced with COVID. A farmer in Nigeria can find a buyer also for his product literally anywhere in the world. And we have seen the work of the World Bank in this area. And actually, so colleagues of the World Bank have been working in the agricultural sector, have been using e voucher and all these instruments to be able to increase access to finance to farmers in the most remote space. So this unprecedented level of global internet connection is transforming countless industries 
finance chief among them. We know that uh, uh, finance can leverage this, uh, uh, this uh, evolution to enable innovative business services and businesses everywhere in the world from agriculture to logistic, education, healthcare. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, myself, coming, I'm from Senegal, here, uh, 10 years ago when I was going back home and wanted uh, after landing from a long trip, long trip to have some food, I had to, to go and, and shop in the city somewhere where I can find a place which was open to eat. Uh, today, uh, if you push off a button, I can have people delivering at your home food at any time of, of, of the day and uh, to be able to pay with, with, with services. So that have created a huge industry in services to today is creating a, a, a thousand of, of jobs, if I cannot say a million. Let me go to Bangladesh in South Asia. Bcash, one of our portfolio companies, the Bangladesh is now the one-stop financial services provider of one out of two Bangladeshi. It took Bcash less than 10 years to have more users than the country entire banking sector in 60 years, with over 64 million registered users as of today. I mean, I cannot talk about it without talking about M-Pesa because it's very close to my heart. Actually, I was in uh, working in Kenya when uh, all the process started. And uh, we know that M-Pesa today launched in 2007 is uh, a super, super app. And I know that Sheila, the deputy governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, will be telling you much more as she has seen from Kenya the evolution. But let me tell you a couple of ingredients that I think were instrumental in making M-Pesa a success. First, uh, policy framework. The Central Bank accepted to have a, a sandbox uh, regulation at a time where a lot of central bankers were kind of uh, uh, hesitating in having this level of innovation. The, 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 the financial sector had uh, also was able to seize the technical evolution that we had in Kenya with a connection to the submarine cable in the eastern part of Kenya, which allowed broadband connection to be uh, much faster. Third, we had a very buoyant and very uh, uh, innovative uh, uh, SME uh, uh, network, which were able to seize that opportunity to develop new tools. So I think that this experience give us a sense of what are the ingredients that are important to make this, this, this happen. Uh, recently, in my own country, uh, we've seen that competition also has been, has been essential in lowering the cost and making access uh, uh, broader. So as we are moving forward, we have some challenges that we will be highlighting. One of them is to ensure that affordability is there and the cost of transaction is much lower than it, than, than it is today. And, and, and we believe at IFC that competition is the main way for us to reach that goal. That's why we've been investing a lot in startups which have been disruptive, uh, and disrupting so, uh, uh, the, the ecosystem uh, and create more competition. So as we look forward in, in the, uh, towards the future is uh, clear that fintech has the potential to underpin inclusive economic growth in emerging countries and all around the world at a much faster uh, rate. You know, we, 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 we talk about uh, agriculture. We are today at a time where we'll be facing a, a huge crisis, a food supply crisis, and uh, having access to insurance, being able to receive payment, being able to receive services uh, 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 directly to the farmer will be making a big difference to address these global challenges we are facing. So we need to be intentional on how to get there. Uh, finance is moving from a vertical to a horizontal one and uh, embedded uh, into just about everything we do. This makes financial stability much more important than ever before. How can we foster innovation and financial inclusion while mitigating uh, 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 risk? This is exactly the report that uh, the team has been Develop and I would like to congratulate the team of IFC, but Jean also and his team for having put this, this, uh, this report. And the report built also on uh, the WDR that was launched uh, three years ago on digital, on digital uh, services and uh, the, the uh, raising the challenges that uh, 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 firms are facing in, uh, in, uh, in uh, emerging economy, uh, spanning from, from access, cost, 
to cybersecurity and privacy. All these issues have to be taken into account, are being taken into account. And I know that in the conversation, a lot of uh, 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 colleagues will be talking about these, these challenges that we are facing. So let me just uh, summarize quickly by saying that this new mindset will require that for traditional financial firm, uh, new technology will need to be embraced. We need to reach consumer with digital solutions. They want to be listening to the customer. This means partner, partnering with fintech provider to offer the services and investing in new solution themselves are, it, it will be, uh, will be a paramount. But maintaining the, the study code is not an option. Unfortunately, being a member of the Broadband Commission, the UN Broadband Commission, I can witness that the cost of access is still very, very high in a lot of countries. So working on reforming the, uh, the, 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 the digital sector and uh, reducing the cost of access will be an important uh, part of it. Secondly, create, uh, uh, be open to sandbox solutions, sandbox regulation. Innovation will only happen if you are open to, uh, to, 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 to new technology, to new way of doing business. And for that, often the regulation in, pla in place is uh, uh, one step behind and needs to catch up all the time. So uh, uh, the sandbox uh, uh, approach uh, has been, will be uh, essential for that. Third, we need to think very carefully about cybersecurity and data privacy. As I said, it was highlighted in our WDR report, is more than ever one of the big challenges that we are to, today uh, facing. But you know, we are very lucky today, today to have specialists, to have regulators, to have practitioners who will be showing, uh, 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 telling us more about their own experience and be able to guide us, all of us, to uh, forest investors, IFC, but also for uh, my colleagues from the World Bank to be able to look to look at the the points that need on the policy side to be uh, to be modified, to be changed, to be improved, so that we can get the goals that we all have, which is to reduce uh, 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 extreme poverty and to have a share prosperity. So I will stop here, uh, uh, but, and I look and I look forward to to, to listening later on uh, to, the, to the to our the discussion of our uh, distinguished panelists. So thank you very much. Back to Jean and Mary. Thank you very much, Magda, uh, for sharing IFC experience and your personal experience and your passion for this topic. I will now hand it over to Marie Pangestu, Managing Director for Development Policy and Partnership at the World Bank. Thank you very much, Marie. Uh, thank you, Jean, uh, and thank you, Magda, for sharing your thoughts. Uh, let me uh, also uh, join Magda by saying this is also a, a topic that is uh, personally very important and very much part of what I've been doing uh, for many, many years, uh, starting from, you know, helping women traders when I was a trade minister, just teaching them basic financial management skills all the way to how uh, we see the role of uh, fintech in financial inclusion and digital economy, more broadly, uh, its role in development. Now, let me just add to Maktar's uh, very much, uh, I, I don't think I could add to Maktar's points uh, about setting the scene for our discussion today, but let me just share three main messages from the joint report that Jean mentioned uh, uh, that uh, will hopefully set the scene for our uh, panel discussion. Uh, first, while gaps still exist, thanks to fintech, we have made significant strides in financial inclusion. Here are some metrics. We heard a lot from Maktar already, but according to the latest Findex data, the share of adults using financial accounts rose dramatically from 41 to 71% in the last 10 years. Uh, furthermore, the gender gap in account ownership has uh, also fallen from 15% to 6% in the last four years in developing countries. And this has been in a large part to uh, mobile money and other digital financial services. For example, in, the, in less than 15 years, over 1.3 billion registered mobile money accounts were created with Sub-Saharan uh, Africa leading the way. Uh, Maktar mentioned the role of M-Pesa. That's certainly uh, one of the big contributors. And uh, financial inclusion can also help us achieve development goals by bundling with 
financial services with other services, such, for example, in Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda, MCOPA, an asset financing platform, has enabled 2 million customers to access a diverse set of products, including smartphones, solar lighting, solar-powered appliances, digital financial services, such as cash loans, and health insurance. The second message is that uh, fintech's impact goes far beyond financial inclusion. Fintech is reshaping financial products, payments, business models, market players, market structure, and even money itself. The, the progress has been accelerated uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, where we saw how digital technologies, such as contactless and QR code-based payments, help governments to deliver cash transfers to those who really need them, especially women and the poor, and also helped uh, SMEs and other uh, businesses continue to uh, have uh, trans transactions, even uh, as we had lockdowns. But fintech is blurring the boundaries of both financial firms and the financial sector, changing the structure of the market, and even calling into the question, what is the essence of a financial institution or money? For example, central bank digital currencies redefine our basic notions of money. E-commerce and other digital platforms are increasingly embedding financial services into their products and crowdfunding and tokenization of financial instruments are reimagining the way capital can be raised. The third message is uh, what Maktar has already emphasized that FinTech poses challenges, while it has its benefits, it also poses challenges because it creates new risks for consumers, providers, and the broader financial system. And this uh, really is about uh, how digitalization has created challenges to the core objectives of a well-functioning financial system, whether it's efficiency and fair competition, financial stability and integ integrity, consumer and investor protection, and cyber and operational soundness, as well as data, data privacy. So these challenges and risks will evolve as products and markets mature. Uh, we will see how uh, new areas of market concentration driven by monopolies, while it may boost financial in inclusion, will impede healthy uh, competition. And we have seen how uh, unregulated or underregulated fintech and big tech terms, while they may offer cheaper services, they can also be abused because they're of their access to consumer data. Uh, and as well as while this might help first time poor consumers, they may also result in over indebtedness and other consumer protection challenges. So as Maktar has emphasized at the end of his remarks, FinTech offers tremendous benefits and opportunities, but there are new challenges and risks faced as the FinTech revolution unfolds and the sector evolves. And we, which brings us uh, to today's really excellent uh, panel. Let me begin by introducing our distinguished uh, panel members. Madhabi Puribuk, Chairperson, Securities and Exchange Board of India. Uh, Koba uh, Gwenatats, Governor, National Bank of Georgia. Sheila Mbaiju, Deputy Governor, uh, Central Bank of Kenya. Jerry Ng, Founder and Chairman of Bangjago, Indonesia and Monica Brand Engel, co-founder and partner of Kona. Let me just uh, start with a general question to all of you. From your respective vantage points, what are the most important FinTech developments to date? And what does the future hold? What do you see as the main opportunities and policy ch challenges? And if you could please be brief in your answers with a maximum of five minutes each, that will help us to get uh, all the uh, point of views across as well as the further questions to be answered. So over to you, uh, Madabi. Thank you so much. And indeed, I'd like to jump straight in into what is it that India has seen over a very relatively short period of about three to four years some very significant developments in the fintech space and another new emerging area which we expect to see going forward. The important is, thing is that they all have a common theme in India. And that theme is that the country is building out digital infrastructure as a public good. The infrastructure is not in private hands. It is in public hands. It's a public good. And on top of that public infrastructure, the entrepreneurs are innovating and building 
the solutions for the citizens of the country through private innovation. So it's a combination of public infrastructure and private innovation, which is really driving the growth of fintech in the country. So let me start with two examples that have already been implemented. And the third, as I said, going forward. So the payments infrastructure in our country has really grown off of, again, a public good called the unified payment interface. And a very large number of fintechs have grown on top of this infrastructure. One of the big reasons why crypto never entered the Indian ecosystem for payments was because this system that we had, which was sponsored by the central bank of the country was itself so efficient. It was instantaneous, it was comprehensive, it was frictionless, and it covered almost the entire population, that there was absolutely no need for crypto to come in and step in as an alternate payment set mechanism in the country. This is one example. The second example is related to the markets area, the capital markets, where we have used technology again in the public space to almost transform the market from a B to B to C model. And what I mean by that is the market infrastructure institutions like the exchanges, et cetera, used to deal purely with the brokers and the clearing members in the system. And they in turn were expected to deal with the consumers or the citizens. This had a lot of structural vulnerability. What we used to call after seeing 2008, you know, too big to fail, too big to jail. And we decided that we wanted to minimize this dependency on the intermediaries. And we wanted our public infrastructure to directly bridge from B to C. So we have succeeded in doing that in our markets through a number of measures. I would say we're almost 75, 80% of the way there, another bit to go, but largely implemented. And this is now being used because now we no longer worry about intermediary risk. It gives us a huge opportunity to scale out and make it a much more competitive space in the capital markets. What we're expecting to see going forward is related to data. But the important difference again in India is that while we are paying a lot of attention to data protection and data privacy, we are paying an equal amount of attention to data empowerment. So we believe that every citizen needs to have access to all his data, wherever it might be residing, for him to use or her to use in a manner that is most important to him or her, and that there should be no restriction or friction in her accessing her own data. Now, this is, of course, most critical in the area of uh, you know, uh, small uh, value lending. It is most critical and we have implemented in our country something called the account aggregator mechanism, which allows every citizen to pull his or her financial information from any available source and pump it at any destination that she wishes to. So this is where we see things going forward. And again, this has been built on public infrastructure with private innovation on top of it. I'd like to end by talking about, as, as you had suggested, uh, main opportunities and main challenges. I think the main opportunity that we see in the country is that data and technology has become so omnipresent in the country that it's starting to become a part of the DNA of every single institution, including the regulator itself, which is us. And we see that as a huge uh, opportunity, because what it means is that very soon we will have a whole generation of digital natives, people who are born into an environment where everything is digital, rather than our generation, which were digital immigrants. So we had to move there, we had to understand it and try and understand the power of data and technology. But very soon, hopefully, that will not be the case. In terms of challenges, I think the, I would sum it up by saying that uh, challenges are really like a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, as a regulator, you, you stop one problem and the next one props up, but that's what makes being a regulator so fun. And uh, we are happy to accept the challenge and uh, to, to, to lead 
uh, with, with uh, allowing and uh, encouraging innovation. And we will deal with the whack a moles along the way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, unified payment system, empowerment of data, uh, and really uh, underlying uh, how uh, you actually embrace the challenge. And I can still see you smiling. So I, I'm very happy. <laughs> that. Uh, Koba, under, uh, over to you. Thank you. And um, as uh, you have mentioned, uh, starting the FinTech agenda in Bali was really important milestone and we do see uh, benefits of its implementation. Uh, let me touch point on uh, the issues which we are going to discuss. First of all, you know, what are the important FinTech uh, developments? Uh, first of all, um, uh, growth of mobile and digital payments has been really remarkable. And this includes everything from digital wallets to peer-to-peer -peer payments to contactless payments. Digital banking has been definitely uh, very important. It is especially came very handy during pandemic when mobility just stopped and it was really necessary to use it as much as possible. And um, it has also led uh, to increased competition in the banking sector, and it has made banking more accessible for many people who may who did not have an access uh, uh, in uh, the situation of traditional banking. FinTech also made it easier for individuals to manage their personal finances, uh, budgeting apps, investment platforms, uh, uh, robo-advisors are just a few examples of the types of services that have been developed, uh, developed with the uh, uh, with fintech, uh, what are the well, how do we see the future developments? Uh, I think that as uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies continue to advance, they are likely to be used in a range of fintech applications and crowd detection to personalized financial advices. The growth of um, uh, finance uh, and data is likely to lead to increased competition in the financial sector and more opportunities for fintech startups. Um, while adoption of blockchain and uh, cryptocurrencies remain at this point uncertain, it is likely that they will continue to be developed and may eventually, eventually have a significant impact on the financial sector. Now, what about the opportunities? I think that FinTech uh, has potential to bring a range of benefits. Uh, financial inclusion, maybe it's not very relevant for Georgia because bank percentage of bank and population is very high, but it definitely has a potential to provide financial services to underserved and, and unbanked population. Efficiency, uh, FinTech has potential to reduce transaction cost and improve the efficiency of financial systems which can benefit consumers and uh, businesses um, alike. And innovation, of course, innovation is uh, very important because FinTech is likely to continue to drive innovation in the financial sector, creating new products and services that meet the changing needs of uh, consumers and uh, businesses. But of course, uh, such a very disruptive um, uh, technologies and challenge changes do not go without challenges. So uh, let me just mention a few challenges that need to be addressed. Among those, I would, um, uh, I would mention cybersecurity. As more financial transactions move online, cybersecurity will become increasingly important issue. And there is a need for robust security measures to protect consumers' personal and financial data. Financial stability, because we are really reaching the, uh, uh, the border when in some cases we don't know what can be the what will be the consequences. And that is why as fintech companies are uh, becoming more established, they may pose a risk to financial stability, particularly, particularly if they are not subject to the same regulatory requirements as traditional banks. And we know that in order to test several products, it is necessary to do so. Consumer protection uh, actually stands out, I think, as a, as, as a challenge. As fintech companies become more prominent in the financial sector, regulators will need to uh, ensure that consumers are protected from fraud and other risks. And regulations, uh, fintech companies are operating in a highly regulated sector and there is a need for 
clear, a clear regulatory frameworks that balance innovation with uh, unknown risks. So in conclusion, uh, this is part of our life. This is what was brought by technologies. It was, by, it was accelerated and expedited uh, with uh, a pandemic. Uh, and uh, while fintech has a potential to bring significant benefits to consumers and businesses, we policy makers also need to carefully balance the opportunities and challenges presented by this rapidly evolving sector. Of course, we need to embrace it in order to make sure that financial services are becoming cheaper and more accessible to population. So that's exactly my five minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Koba, for underlining uh, the benefits, but as well as the challenges that we, we must embrace uh, and deal with. Uh, Sheila, you're next. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak, uh, moving on promptly. Uh, Pan-African growth is and will be enhanced by digitization. Um, when we look at the Kenyan fintech system, uh, ecosystem, we see it cuts across all sectors. We're talking about payments, credit, health, insurance, pension, data, investment markets. So it's no longer just accessing payment um, services or payment facilities. And what we found as well is during the COVID-19 period, COVID-19 acted like a catalyst or a tailwind to digitization. And there was a huge increase in, in the volumes. When we look across Africa, we see the impact that you had mentioned earlier about the, the, the way that digitization and fintech is enabling so many people to have financial um, access. In Kenya, we currently have financial access of 84%, and I can see South Africa here is at 90, and Seychelles is the leader at 95. And again, when we talk about which areas of the ecosystem have been included, you know, you get surprised. There's um, renewable energy and aviation and agriculture and health. Um, are also included now in this system. How does the system, how was the system structured? What does it look like? Well, we have many players. The main players are the banks, the financial institutions, the payment service providers. It's interesting with these because we've only just um, uh, regulated them. They've been there for a long time. We have currently 200 applications that have come through and 20 have been licensed. And the same with the digital credit providers, we have about 400 applications and about 20 have been licensed. So it takes time also to filter them. But we must make sure, I think someone was asking whether um, with the big techs and with these, these types of um, quasi financial institutions, and you know, I think it was the governor of the Bank of um, the Saab, the Bank of South Africa, who said if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and sounds like a duck, it is a duck. And so for us, we take that kind of attitude. We study what they're doing and we say, how does it relate to the financial sector? And does their activity have an impact and could it destabilize the financial sector? If it does, it, it needs to be regulated by, 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 by the financial sector, um, government financial sector act. Um, fintechs are also there and obviously the government is also one of the main players. When we look at the ecosystem and we talk about the elements that make it successful, it's vibrant. There's many, many active, engaged players. There's a positive policy support. It's not supposed to be a negative. And regulators who engage with their innovation, who participate in various innovative uh, events that are happening. We also have se select a sectorial collaboration and access to talent. Again, when I look at the sector, what we're looking for is safety, security, financial sector stability, access, and resilience. So when we look at the regulatory perimeter, it's been expanding the whole time. It started in 2007. I think Maktam made reference to that earlier. But in, in the years to 2022, we've continually brought in new regulations to make sure that we are managing the sector. So recently, for example, there was the digital credit provider regulation that came in in 2022. Data governance, we have the Data Protection Act of 2019. When we look at fraud and online scams, we have the Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act of 2018. In addition, the central bank has given guidance note to the banking sector and also cyber security guidelines um, to the uh, payment service providers. Resilience and agility in payments is also important. We've come out with our national payment strategy 
And we've done a CBDC discussion paper for the people of Kenya to, to give us their, their comments. Risk-based activity, we do test-based, test and learn approach to the fintechs, and we're continually upgrading our risk capabilities, our risk analysis capabilities. AML, CFT, we have now our national um, risk assessment for the country. And we also participate as members of ESMALAC, the Eastern and Southern African Anti-Money Laundering Group. Uh, with competition, we put forward a banking charter, which focuses on customer centricity. And with the big techs, we're doing a test and learn. We keep a close eye on them. Cross-border, we're very keen on cross-border because we think this is the benefit of trading Pan-African. And so we're collaborating with other regional central banks to put in papers where we can make sure that we have standards and payment structures in place that, that, that benefit the populace. What I said earlier about COVID impact um, and the catalyst impact it had, mobile transactions, payment transactions went up 21% during this period, whereas branch and ATM and the traditional banking went down about 5%, with agency banking going down about 10%. Opportunities, obviously, cost, the opportunities that we still have to improve our system, reducing cost and friction, increasing efficiency, increasing competition, and broadening access to financial services. The challenges, systemic, this is um, part of the DNA. I think my, my colleague from India made reference to that. This is part of the DNA of our of our, of our culture now, not just of our financial system. Uh, potential financial stability implications, cyber risk, inadequate AML, CFT frameworks, you never seem to do enough, you seem to have to keep improving it, and obviously data privacy. Critical success factors is customer centricity, an enabling regulatory environment, interoperability, digital providers that are cost effective, private sector investment and safe and secure systems. So in conclusion, I say embrace digital, it is the future. Build and review the infrastructure continuously, stable, resilient and growing. Allow for innovation, do not be prescriptive. The, the, the regulators cannot determine the innovation, do not be prescriptive. Have a very keen risk focus, introduce laws and guidance and walk alongside the innovators. Don't be ahead of them because you, you'll inhibit them. Don't be behind them because they'll take you by surprise. And when you look at big tech, ask, assess the possible outcomes of big tech before it happens. And finally, open your minds to, to, to tomorrow. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Very prof profound messages at the end. Uh, good summary. Uh, and I'm sure our private sector participants here uh, can also uh, chime in on that. Uh, over to you, Jerry. Thank you, thank you, Mary, for uh, inviting me. I, I will not, I will not repeat. I think, uh, I think a lot of the previous panelists have touched on a lot about cybersecurity, data privacy, and so forth. So, so let me, let me perhaps also. I think I will not specifically talk about opportunities and and challenges, but allow me to offer perhaps uh, four four observations. I think the first one, interestingly. I think we have seen two level of convergence. I think in the past, we have seen financial services operate sort of pretty much the, you know, on a very silo basis. So there's e-money players, there's alternative lending platform, digital banks, wealth management, digital assets. But I think over the last uh, you know, couple of years, I've seen a very, very interesting convergence whereby a lot of these uh, service providers are coming together sort of as one platform. I think there's one level of convergence. The second level of convergence is not only within the financial services, but we've also seen the convergence of, uh, of other verticals, such as e-commerce, mobility, and so forth. So I think the second convergence is where the formations of what I call the uh, potentially very powerful ecosystems. Okay, so that's number one, convergence. Number two, I think as what I think uh, uh, previously, I think Makta touched on Bcash and Mvisa, and then Madani talked about unified, uh, you know, the India example also. I think we're looking at, uh, we're looking at, you know, two keywords here, reach and speed. I think the, the speed in which these sort of new players are reaching millions and millions and tens of millions of, uh, of users, actually very, very impressive. 
just to give you a couple examples, I think like, for example, the, the partners that Bank Jago is working with GoPay, just in the span of two to three years, they have been able to have uh, to reach monthly active users of, uh, you know, in the tens of, uh, in the tens of millions. And another example, just over the last uh, two, three years, there are 16 millions of uh, uh, crypto trading accounts opened in Indonesia. Now, we're not arguing whether it's bad or good crypto trading, but the reality is that the speed in which, you know, all these platforms are able to reach millions of users are super impressive. That's the second observation. The third observation, this is a notion of great innovation vis-a-vis -vis sustainability. I think it's no doubt. We have seen over and over again, a lot of uh, great innovations, a lot of those uh, you know, brilliant mind trying to challenge the established, uh, uh, the established uh, 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 players. But I think we ought to actually examine all the species models very, very carefully and very, very closely. Because I would argue a lot of those, uh, you know, a lot of those innovations, you know, very innovative ideas may not necessarily be profitable. And I believe that anything which is not profitable is probably not going to be sustainable. So again, while all these things are very promising, but I would argue that only a handful of real business models that would actually be sustainable over a period of, you know, over a long period of time. Lastly, my observations, I think that regulators, I think needs to, needs to be very open-minded. I'm actually, I'm very glad, I think, you know, the, the panelists, the, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, earlier than me was talking about to keep an open mind and so forth. I think that's absolutely, I think the right things. But I think the regulator also has to acknowledge and has to realize that, that the, uh, you know, the, the complexities of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, what is gonna come out from the ecosystems it's actually going to be pretty complicated. And I think, I think uh, you know, so, so, so I think the regulators uh, will have to actually move quite fast. And, and ideally, ideally, I think, you know, to be able to understand multiple, you know, uh, you know uh, verticals rather than just sort of in the financial services. So those are actually my, 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 four, my four observations instead of talking specifically about opportunities as well as, as, well as challenges. I think in summaries, I'm just going to say that, uh, you know, uh, the word is ahead of us is exciting and at the same time, very, very scary. So I think uh, that's probably what I would, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, my, that's, my, that's my remarks, uh, Mari. Thank you, Jerry. I, I hope you didn't scare the regulators when you said <laughs> exciting but scary. But I, 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 from what we heard from the regulators, they are ready for it to walk side, uh, not behind you, but uh, at your side to anticipate all, all these changes ahead. Uh, Monica, uh, over to you. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm Monica Brand Engel, founding managing partner of Quona uh, uh, Capital which is a venture firm focused exclusively on fintech for inclusion in emerging markets. I'm honored to be here with such a esteemed panelist as I do think uh, we are probably in terms of assets under management, the smallest player among us. And I also am honored given the thoughtful comments. So I want to build on a few things that were said and really underscore. Um, uh, my, my first point is really uh, represented by the thoughtful panelists, uh, you know, starting with Chairperson Booch which is the importance of forward thinking, courageous regulators. And I say courageous because before UPI, and I'll talk about PICS for Brazil, we haven't mentioned Brazil, but I think it's incredibly important when we talk about open-minded and experimentation to really uh, use these examples as forward thinkings. And really I thought uh, Deputy Governor Mbegwe uh, was beautiful and she said, keeping an open mind as those regulations take forth. Because I do think, for example, I'll use one specific example of UPI, which really was the inspiration for PICS in Brazil. It actually decided to do some variations on what they did in India. For example, they allowed banks to earn, uh, instead of having interchange be totally eliminated and be entirely free uh, as a public good, they allowed for some monetization. And actually what happened there was the speed of adoption and collaboration by the private sector versus resistance was quite fast. So I only say that not because one decision was right. I mean, there are different markets, different contexts, 100%. But 
But I do think as each successive regulator adopts and, and uh, I think the openness to really say, actually this might, there might be a, an improvement, a version 2.0 of this very thoughtful regulation. So one, again, really applaud the courage of the people on this call because you are the leaders and allowing private sector to flourish, but also the open-mindedness that I think Deputy Governor Rezre beautifully said. So point number two, and I think Jerry underscored it, and I was gonna say, is the importance of testing and regulatory sandboxes. So that's where venture is born. You think of a petri dish, think of a scientific experiment. The work I do, I'm actually right now calling in from South Africa. We were in Brazil two weeks ago, and in both places, Kona was uh, sponsoring ecosystem events where we brought together our co-investors, regulators, startups, which are really nascent ideas, some of which, many of which will fail. But the idea of that experimentation is only how innovation happens. How penicillin was born, it was an accident. And I think only these uh, allowing the enabling environment for this innovation is really critical. So I think allowing even things, and I will put you know, CBDC and some of the digital currency in that box, because, and I'll build on what Jerry said, not only are some of those new digital rails, whether it's crypto or Web3, are they faster and deeper? They're actually stronger and more resilient. So this idea of, of realizing that our existing rails, our existing infrastructure can only reach so far. And that if we really wanna reach the 7 billion people, or you know, half of whom are on banks, we really need to begin developing new types of infrastructure. So uh, I really do think that uh, testing and innovation is critical. The third point I wanted to make, and it's, and it's so represented, uh, and I think actually it was uh, open in the uh, opening remarks by both uh, Makar Diop and as well as Marie Pangestu uh, around uh, what I describe as embedded finance. So embedded finance or use case finance is where the core business is not a financial service. You mentioned uh, agricultural security. We have two ag tech deals. Actually, one is in India called Aria. We have another one in Turkey called Tarpin. And basically the purpose, they each have very different business models. One is uh, financing inputs for smallholder farmers. The other in India is actually financing warehouses and bringing efficiencies to the agricultural supply chain. But both of them are powered by financial services that are embedded into the model. And I bring up embedded finance because that convergence that Jerry described, it's really integrating financial services with a, an adjacent business, whether it's e-commerce, logistics, healthcare, ad, and to understand the power of fintech all types of fintech to really drive these adjacent services that change lives. And so again, I really uh, think that's an important area of innovation. It's, it's the fastest part of Kona's portfolio, an area we're quite excited about. Um, and, and the last thing I will just say, um, and again, I really applaud the organizers of this panel, is the idea of the public and private working together. We spend a lot of time with regulators uh, actually engaging them. They actually sometimes will go to our portfolio companies and ask their advice on regulation. And I really want to encourage that. Again, it can be done behind closed doors. I know sometimes optics, you don't want to you know, show that there's any cronyism. I just think the importance of being informed, continually informed by what's happening, the learning that's happening on the ground is really critical. So again, I thank you and applaud the uh, organizers of this. I, I, I am not afraid. I'm super excited. I am, well, sure, I'm sure the few things I fear, but the action, I'm really excited about what I see, the diversity of countries and experiments that are happening that I really think will make for a really exciting future. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for uh, those additional observations. I think we've had a really good uh, a round of uh, all the perspectives uh, and, and a very broad picture of what the situation is, as well as the forward look. Unfortunately, we are, we are very short of time, so we're just going to go for one final round uh, of questions where I will also roll in some of the questions from the audience. So I'm going to go back to you, and this time you will have, uh, I'm, unfortunately, I have to cut you to about two minutes each, so it's going to be really short, so uh, incorporate your closing remarks as well. So uh, for the regulators, what areas would you want to see the private sector pay more attention as they adopt fintech approaches? And there was a question from the audience that any of the regulators can also uh, address. What do you think will be the role of a central bank uh, digital currency? And you can also add any of your closing remarks. And for the private sector, what do you want the regulators to focus on? Uh, we heard a lot about convergence and speed. 
Uh, and there was also a question from the audience, which I think may be uh, interesting to answer. What are fintech investors looking for? Um, and, and, and also, what do you think policymakers uh, sh should do to uh, drive more investment into the fintech space in a safe and sustainable manner? So um, let me uh, perhaps uh, go, uh, go again in the same order, uh, start with Madabi. So if you could just be very brief, around two minutes each, that would be really helpful. Thank you. So um, what is it that we would want the innovators to really do with the regulatory hat on? I think since all of us primarily want to see more and more innovation around the inclusion theme in our countries, and that necessarily means scale, so the only piece of advice I'd give is that when you move from being a pilot or a small enterprise and you move to scale, at that time, just like you map the consumer journey and you digitize everything, you should map the regulation and compliance and digitize that too. Very often we find that the entire business model of the entrepreneur is digital, but compliance is all manual. So if only we merge the two and, and ensured that compliance was also digital, I think we'd all be very happy. And I would just say one more thing on, on our part, what we hope to do to keep pace with the innovation in the market. And the phrase that springs to mind is only a diamond cuts a diamond. So just like innovators are using data and technology, it's up to us as regulators to also adopt data and technology in order to be more effective regulators and more efficient regulators. Thank you. Thank you, Madhavi. Uh, over to Koba. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, let me just combine two, uh, two, two questions quickly in two minutes. One was about uh, you know, CBDCs. I think CBDC is something which uh, puts the central bankers in a very unique position because, I mean, it, 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 it in fact, um, forcing us to pick up the mantles of innovators, which is very unusual for us because we uh, used to be, and we are quite conservative usually in our approaches, but uh, in this time, we, we have to uh, be out of our comfort zone. And... Uh, uh, because it uh, still provides a lot of opportunities. And I, I think that um, uh, the way we are approaching it, we had a, a research and uh, we are approaching pilot uh, phase now, um, and uh, we uh, are going to use some use um, uh, cases which think will be relevant for Georgia, because we want to make sure that it's not replacement for current systems, but it's rather an addition to exist and competent and complement each other. So. We want it to be really efficient, effective, and then also observe what pilot brings to us. And the second question uh, was um, about what we want uh, and what kind of relationship we want to see with fintech companies. Uh, our approach has been to create the platform, to, in, to create enabling situation environment for fintech companies. And we see uh, this is as, as, as like um, uh, private uh, public partnership. That is why we want them to be very active. We want the to develop as many products as as, uh, as possible to make sure that the later we are able to test them uh, and uh, bring benefits to fintech companies as a part of the business, but at the, to the consumers as well. So I think this is you know, what we want to have a win-win position. And I very much hope that over time we'll be able to achieve this. Thank you. I think you are muted, Marit. Okay, now it's... Uh, uh, Sheila? Yeah, I've unmuted. Thank you. I'm talking about CBDCs. I think it's very interesting. And I think just like the previous speaker, it is an issue of um, central banks coming out of their comfort zone. Obviously, the benefits is AML, CFT. You've got a monetary policy transmission. You've got interoperability. You've got cost advantages, speed, because you're reducing the payment chains. And then on the negative, you've got financial inclusion. Will all people be able to use the CBDC if they don't have the right type of technology? You've got the risks, the cyber, the policy points of failure. You've got competition with banks for deposits. 
So there's all kinds of issues in there. It's, it's a very complex area. I think one of the um, non-regulators have made reference to the fact that we're dealing with very complex areas. I think what we, we in Kenya say is don't follow trends, seek to solve problems. Mm -hmm. And so we want to understand what is the need that we're trying to solve? What is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, can, they, can a CBDC accelerate our value adding innovation? Can a CBDC enhance our cross-border transactions? Can a CBDC have the same confidence and trust or more confidence and trust than the existing physical money? Moving on to this issue about what do fintechs, investors, what are they looking for and what do, we, what do we want from them? I think in Kenya, we spent a lot of time on digital access, fintechs and e-commerce. And what we're looking for now is we want, we want to shift to a higher value service chain with the digital providers. We want to enable cross-border growth. We've talked about the Pan-African trade that I spoke about right at the beginning. We want to boost technology adoption and efficiency, not just the adoption, but actually the efficiency. Rationalize trade, tra rationalize trade blocks and restrictions. Find a way to break some of these restrictions that have happened under manual systems and secure livelihoods and productivity. So if you're coming to Kenya, can you look at agri-tech? Can you look at health tech? Can you look at education tech? And can you look at software development? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Sheila. Jerry, over to you. Yes, I think, you know, I think, uh, I think Mary, there's always this, there's always this tensions between the, between the FinTech players and, and, and the regulators. Because if you ask the FinTech players, I think in short, they'll say, look, minimal, me, very minimum the regulations, which I think that undoubtedly will make regulator and rightfully to be very, very uncomfortable, I think. So a lot of people are trying to, again, move on to what's the right balance between innovations and, and, and uh, you know, and, and regulations. What, 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 I, what, what I think, okay, what, what I think needs to be done, I think some, you know, the earlier panelist was talking about, uh, you know, seating side by side. I think that's probably the right, the right approach. I think instead of, instead of the players and the regulators, sort of sitting across uh, the table from each other, I think it should be sitting on the same side, okay? On the same side, meaning that, meaning that the regulator should, should make sure, okay, whoever wants to enter into this, uh, you, know, into, you, know, you know, doing financial services would, would uh, you know, would, would really be, uh, be uh, you know, be meeting, you know, uh, make, the, you know make the requirement to be, to be strict, okay? And and uh, and if need be, okay, you know, you know, increase the capital requirement. But after that, allow the innovations, okay, allow those players, okay, give them room to innovate, to experiment, and to make mistakes, okay. But you know, you know, you know, if, if you're able to basically qualify them upfront, okay, and really set up a very very stringent requirement, and then. You know, and also you 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 know you you you, you make sure that uh, you know the uh, you know the uh, the players okay have enough capital to sustain uh, the losses and, and so forth. Give them a little bit more, give them a little bit more freedom. Okay, so I'm 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 going to probably say something that uh, that uh, you know at the risk of uh, upsetting some of the audience. Okay, I always believe that uh, that at the end of the day, financial services business is a business for responsible adults. So if the regulators are very, very, you know, uh, selective in terms of allowing who can play, who cannot play, that actually I, I, you know, I'm actually sympathetic and I, I tend to agree with it because at the end of the day, if you put, if, if you put, you know, running the business of financial services in the hand of irresponsible people, I think it can actually cause a lot of instability. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I'm trying to watch the expression of the regulators while you were saying that. <laughs> but uh, Monica, you have the, the last word, but not, of course, uh, last but not least, uh, over, over to you, Monica. Thank you, Ari. Uh, so as folks know, Quona is a, a fintech for inclusion investor. We believe in about impact. And it's exactly like Jerry said, it's the marriage of profits and purpose. And I think fintech is the is the new case where you can see this happen. And I do think uh, we also support regulation. I think smart regulation. And I'm going to make a plug for two that actually have had powerful impacts in some of our core markets. Uh, EKYC, KYB, and e-invoicing. If you look at what happened in Mexico, 
the ability of some digital lenders to massively expand who they could reach in terms of how they scaled with quality, managing portfolio at risk. Again, and that really requires regulators to allow that. And it means, you know, sort of letting go a little bit of control of privacy, control of how, you know, going uh, beyond the traditional ways we check and verify identity. So really encouraging folks to look at those innovations in particular as really transformative ones. Uh, more broadly, what I would say is this, uh, and picking up a comment earlier about collecting data, I would love to have more regulatory sandboxes, vetting people and character. I couldn't agree more with what Jerry said, letting people of high integrity and high character receive those ability to test and experiment in exchange for delivering data. So I think they shouldn't be able just to get you know free reign. They should give information learnings back to the regulators so they can really begin making and informing smart regulation. So again, uh, I think there's a lot to learn from other markets uh, and I'm very much looking forward to sharing what we're learning in ours. Thank you so much, everybody. We Let me just close this, uh, if you can allow me one or two minutes uh, extra time over uh, our allo allocated time of 10 o'clock to just thank all of you uh, for a really, really excellent uh, discussion and all your different perspectives that I think uh, is, is not just talking about what we, what's happening now, but what, what we should be doing uh, moving forward. And it is about the 1.4 billion who does, don't have uh, accounts yet and the half who don't actually have access. So uh, we need to do our uh, all our collective efforts to really have the reach and speed as uh, Jerry uh, put it. But uh, with uh, achieving efficiency, we need to do it in a, in a sustainable uh, manner. So innovations, but in a sustainable manner, how can we uh, really uh, push forward the innovations, uh, as Monica said, uh, which has profit and purpose? Uh, and how do regulators uh, oversee all that? I think uh, I, I'm very happy to hear, uh, it seems like we have a convergence of views, at least on, on how uh, on regulations that they shouldn't be prescriptive. We are talking about smart regulations and smart regulators, I guess, um, and uh, to have an open mind uh, and to sit on the same side of the table as the innovations are going to evolve. Uh, and we really need to be, as, uh, as I think Sheila said, uh, side by side with the innovators not behind or we will be taken by surprise, but we should be allowing the innovations to happen in a responsible manner uh, and, and really uh, watch out for all uh, the, the potential risks. And I, I think from this uh, private sector, we heard that uh, I think Jerry and Monica said innovators, uh, uh, is, is, is the innovation is not the issue. The, the issue in, in a sense, technological innovation is not the end to itself. Uh, it's only uh, a, a, a good investment if it is uh, profitable and sustainable. Uh, and to maybe paraphrase what Jerry said about uh, the business of responsible adults, I think what he meant was that innovation and technology are the, uh, the, the means, but what you really need is to still have the fundamentals of the financial services embedded in, in that uh, particular uh, business entity. And that's really what regulators uh, should be focusing on. I hope I, I, I interpreted that right, uh, Jerry, because <laughs> I think the regulators all in this audience, at least they're all res very responsible. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and ma many uh, we will see uh, moving forward uh, will be very open-minded and smart in, in the way they will move forward. And I, I really just want to close with the point that Sh uh, Sheila, I think, mentioned that we are talking about how to have uh, uh, more and more of the higher value chain of the financial services, whether it's in the use cases, whether it's in the cross-border possibility of it. Uh, and really, it is about how we have digital ad adoption and efficiency and innovation for development. You know, what's the purpose here? It's for development. It's for, for inclusion. It's for reach. It's for access. And it is uh, 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 for profit, but also for purpose. So uh, in, in a responsible and sustainable manner. So I, I hope that I've uh, managed to capture at least the main highlight that those are the main highlights from me. And I'm uh, uh, sure that our World Bank colleagues, our IFC colleagues are listening listening very carefully to all this uh, because we will be working with all of you uh, to make sure that this happens, that we will have the reach and the access and that uh, digital is the future. 
the, we are in a world of digital natives. Uh, it's, there's no looking back, but how do we make sure the future is sustainable, um, inclusive, uh, and benefits everybody. Thank you, everybody. A really a great panel. Uh, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you. And thank you for thank staying you. up where I know many of you were in, in, in different parts of the world. So thank you very much for staying up for this panel. Bye-bye. <laughs>